well skull. Now you'll notice on that x-ray, as we'll talk about when we get to positioning, we're chopping off the lower portion. You might say, well, that's incorrect. That needs to be repeated. But as you'll find out, because the skull has so many regions and so many different bones and different anatomy, we're going to center at different points based on those positioning lines that we often talk about, that we'll talk about a lot here in a second. So for this PA Caldwell skull, when we say skull, we're referring only to the cranium area. When we say cranium, cranium only refers to the upper half of the skull. So I always say if you put your hand in front of your nose like this, everything from the tip of your nose and up is what we consider the cranium area. Everything from the tip of your nose and down is going to fall under the facial bones area. Two distinct different regions that we're going to talk about. Skull is the overall categorization of everything. Cranium refers to the top half. Facial bones refers to the bottom half. Keep that in mind as we move forward because when we're memorizing all these bones, that's going to be very, very important. Question? Um, yesterday, I saw an order for a shunt series. Shunt series, yes. What is that? I'm glad you brought that up. So shunt series, that's something I used to do a lot of x-rays of when I was at Texas Children's. A shunt is a device put into a child's head and body to help drain hydrocephaly when they have a lot of water on the head, so to speak, a lot of fluid in the skull. And that shunt system will help it drain through the body and help it go out through the waste system. So when you do a shunt series, you're gonna do a skull, two view skull, and you're gonna do a body x-ray, two view, to follow that shunt from the top down to the bottom to make sure it's still in place. So sometimes you'll see it in adults, and see it was an adult, what you do it all? Yeah, the 40 year old. That means he had it put in when he was a child, and he's just kept it for his whole life. So that's actually a great way to get a skull x-ray because it requires part of that mm -hmm. protocol. Also your skeletal surveys, it's another great way to get your skull x-rays because a skeletal survey has everything. It's <laughs> off to a great start today. Maybe pick a different corner for the paper towels, though, just in case. Uh, I have a question. Right, good idea. Yes, question. So the cranium, the tip of the nose, and the bottom. Facial bones, tip of the nose, down. Correct. And then all together is the skull. All together is the skull. Keep that in mind because people will hear cranium and they assume it's the entire head. It's not, it's only a portion. It's the same with facial bones, it's only a portion. Of course, each of those portions have subcategories of all those different bones that we're going to learn to label and memorize. Now, look at that image on the right. That's a great view of an entire skull. Um, honestly, this probably could have been collated down because you often don't need the entire skull like you see there, depending on what region they've ordered. Once again, cranium, you just need the top half, facial bones, you need the bottom half. But probably you saw it right away. What's one thing you can notice in that x ray that's a big no no? Nose rings. Nose ever Did you put something on? On their head? Huh? Nose earrings. The box. It's about those little things on the side? Yeah, but if you look at the TV, it's like the white stuff on the side. You see? Oh. The lines? So did they well, first off, that's the ear. <laughs> you can see the ear soft tissue on the sides. Mm -hmm. On the very, very edge that you're referring to, that's probably these little paddles we use to hold the head still. Oh, okay. There's little ring loose sponges we can put on either side of the head to keep the head still. And when you're doing pediatrics, that is vital. Because let me tell you, try to tell a two-year-old to keep their head still for a skull x-ray. It's not going to happen. You got to get in there with those, I call them big ear muffs. Big ear muffs, compress both sides of the head and keep it nice and still. Otherwise, they're going to be doing this on you the whole time. You got a blurry x ray. But you can also notice on this x ray, that's why I put this in here. This person's missing a big portion of the mandible right here. See that black spot? Mm -hmm. Person probably had cancer. They removed that big portion of the mandible. Um, but within this one extra, guys, there's just dozens of anatomy that we can name. Don't be deceived by you because of anatomy you see here. <laughs> there is a lot of stuff on these x-rays that we got to learn to label. And unfortunately, the registry, just, they're going to be random with it. So we've got to master all those parts. But one thing I want you to take a look at and write this down, because we're going to talk about this a lot. And this is a guaranteed registry question. You're going to see the word Petrus Ridge come up a lot. Very important because those Petrus ridges help us determine if we position the skull correctly, ideally for that PA Caldwell x-ray and that Waters x-ray. That's the bless you. That's not going to make a lot of sense now, but when we get to positioning, we're going to really dive further into those Petrus ridges and how they will shift position, depending on how the skull is positioned for the x-ray. Now, one thing I want you to write down as well is the Petrus ridges. Well, let me ask you first of all, does anybody know where the Petrus ridges are located? Anyone that studied ahead? Where are the petrous ridges in the knee? Like what the specific knee? cranial bone are the petrous ridges located on? Zygophobe. 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 Z
Occipital. One person got it right. The temporal? It's the temporal bone. Oh. Or temporal bones, plural, because we have two, a left and a right. Petrus ridges are found on top of the temporal bones. Now, why is that important? Well, not only for identifying correct positioning when we talk about Caldwell versus Waters x-rays, but the Petrus ridges, and put a big star on this, guys, the Petrus ridges are the densest area of x-ray penetration in the skull, or the thickest area, we could say, as well. You will see that as a question on your registry and your practice exams. That is the densest and thickest area of x-ray penetration in the skull. Based on how all the anatomy overlaps in comparison to that area. So as we see right here, guys, the Petrus ridge is literally this line we're seeing right here. You see how I'm following that line? This is all temporal bone. And that line or that edge is the Petrus ridge. Ridge means like border or top of something. The Petrus ridges are the densest and thickest area of x-ray penetration in the human skull. And when I say Petrus ridges, this is what I'm talking about right here, guys. That's what I'm tracing with my finger. The line. That line. And that's something you want to start mastering right now to be able to identify on these x-ray radiographs. It's going to be a big, big deal on the registry. Now, we'll come back to these when we start talking about specific anatomy, but one that I love, you know, I always have those ones I really like, those words. I like the word Krista Galley. I mean, I feel like a pretty girl's name. You know, I think of her a great girl's name. Name her Krista Galley. It's a great name, just saying. But Krista Galley is the top of the ethmoid bone. It's like a big spike that comes up. We'll talk about that in a second. Huh? Question? Is the or They are on the temporal, <laughs> temporal bones, plural. There's two temporal bones. No one likes Krista Galley. I think that's a great girl's name. I'm just saying. I like Galley <laughs> or my daughter. It means Galilea. the border, border of the top. It's the top border of the temporal bones. Yeah. And we're going to break that down more specifically later when we actually talk about each individual cranial bone. For now, I want you to focus on that being the densest and thickest area of penetration, as well as an identification, uh, anatomy identification to ensure that we position the skull correctly. We'll come back to that more as we talk more about positioning. And that the Krista Galley is the most superior of the ethmoid bone? But what are you saying about that? You said it's the most superior of the ethmoid bone? Correct. The Krista Galley is the most superior point of the ethmoid bone. You're going to go back and break We, we are. This is just okay. an overview right now. We're going to go through each of these. Pop, trust me, you're going to know more about these bones than you ever want to know in your life. Stay tuned. Is, 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 that one of those, is that one of those registry questions? Yes, it is. Okay. There we go. Now look at this crazy thing. Part of this, this is another example here of a different view that we do of the cranium and facial bones. This specifically is what we call an AP axial view. Axial meaning what, of course? Angulation. An angulation. This is a very sharp angulation. It's what we call a Towns method skull x-ray. And it's one of those things I find fascinating when you think about through history when they're designing this type of x-ray. Kind of like when they said, you know, we're going to shoot through the mouth and see part of the C-spine. When they came up with this x-ray, they devised this plan to elongate the skull, to not only see the skull elongated, but to project a portion of the sphenoid bone through the foramen magnum, which you see right here. So the circle is the foramen magnum on the back of the occipital bone. Inside are portions of the sphenoid bone, which is in the center of your skull. Things like the posterior conoid process, the dorsum celli. That doesn't make sense right now, but we're going to break those down as we move forward as well. So just a fascinating thing to think about when they were coming up with these x-rays. But for these two, once again, call the Towns method or AP axial. I always refer to these as the alien head views. That's how I've always remember it, because it looks like an alien head. At least it does to me. Like an elongated alien head. You don't see that? Is it, is it 30 degrees crowded? We'll get to that. Don't worry about that yet. But it's a 30 degree angulation called a correct with, this, with the chin tucked. So you elongate the skull and project that anatomy through the foramen magnum. Yes. Question? Which is the better energy? Like, what you say? Well, these are two different types. Two different so this okay, is focused so. on cranium. This is focused on facial bones. Okay. Now, one thing to point out once again, guys, look at what we're labeling. Again, the Petrus ridges. As Petrus ridges are going to populate in different areas depending on how we position the head on the skull x-rays. Right here, now we see the Petrus ridges on either side of the foramen magnum. Same thing over here. It kind of looks like little bat wings come out the side. You see right there? Yeah. Mm -hmm. But we're going to once again break all this down individually, piece by piece. It's just the general overview of the positions we're looking at here so far. Oh, this is getting on my nerves. 
this computer can say it's like out of space and keeps freezing up my corner. There's some good typical lateral views, guys. Lateral view of the entire skull, lateral view of the cranium. Same concept. I would say actually both these x-rays are actually kind of done incorrectly because in general, when you do a skull x-ray, once again, we're specifically either doing the cranium, facial bones, mandible, nasal bone, whatever. You never really need the entire skull to see right here. So in other words, if I were doing this for just cranium, I'd actually be chopping all this off right here. Not where the tip of the nose is, like I said. Everything below the nose is facial. Everything above is going to be the cranial area that we're focusing on. When you see a lateral facial bone x-ray, you'll see all this cut off at the top, and we'll be just focused on the face area. There's going to be little variances, and that's where we're going to be identifying what position we're actually looking at. When you see a full view like this, that's just a lazy tech being lazy. And you'll see in your text, if they ever get a facial bone x-ray, they'll do it just like this. But that's just overkill. You don't need all this up here. All we're focused on is the face. If they is anyone done sinus x-rays, they're still coming quite, quite often. Sinus x-rays. If I'm doing a sinus x-ray, do I need all this? No. No, because where are my sinuses located? Just right here. Mm -hmm. I have four major sinus groups right there in the front of the face. So if I'm being an ethical tech and I'm being an optimized tech, not only am I going to center better, but I'm going to cut all that extra garbage off to help illuminate those sinus x-rays, which can be hard to view and hard to see if we're not optimizing our techniques and our combination. Now, once again, there is a million pieces of anatomy that we can label on this x-ray. We're going to break it down piece by piece, slide by slide. Don't panic, especially when you start seeing all the millions of things that are going to be labeled. It's all going to start making sense. And I'll show you what the best things to focus on are, even though we should focus on all of it. There are some stuff that's going to be more commonly asked of you as compared to others. One big one, for example, one of my favorite things, by the way, because I think this is so cool looking, is that little hook right there? Mm -hmm. that little dip? Does anybody know what that is? It's a very, 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 very good, oh. very, very vital piece of anatomy, the cella tersica, that's found on top of the sphenoid bone. Mm -hmm. That's a way that we can check that we have a true lateral if we see that nice, beautiful hook like you see right there that converts the head to a true lateral. If you look over here, see that's a little harder to see? Looks like it's like oblique. That's because the head's turned incorrectly. This is not a true lateral. Versus this, nice, beautiful, true lateral. Now, what is important about that cell tersica? Does anybody know what the purpose of that little dip is? It has a very specific primary purpose in its design. Anybody know? <coughs> very good. Yeah, say it louder. Did you look it up in the book? Yeah. <laughs> That's cheating. <laughs> but I'm glad you looked in the book. So, Shemekha said the pituitary gland. So, that houses the pituitary gland, which is the master gland in the body, on the brain. So, it's like a little saddle that holds the pituitary gland. <coughs> it's just incredible. Is it on both sides, or is there only one? There's only one. There's only one, one little cella tersica. By the way, cella tersica <laughs> means Turkish saddle. It turns like a Turkish saddle. It looks like a saddle. It saddles or holds the pituitary gland or brain. In fact, all this, all these bones are designed to house your brain properly. So where's the brain? All in here. Now, can you see the brain on an x-ray? You cannot. The brain's actually invisible on an x-ray. We only see the brain on CTs and MRIs. And also, you have to introduce contrast to eliminate the brain. Now, great news, we don't have to really worry about brain anatomy yet. We will talk more about brain anatomy in RADPRO4, but not in as much detail as CT and MRI. Sigh of relief, because as much as I love anatomy, good God, I hate brain anatomy. It is so confusing. It is so confusing. If you remember from A&P, brain anatomy is a nightmare. But luckily for you, we don't even worry about that too much. That's mostly a CT and MRI thing. When you get to CT and MRI, you'll learn all you want to know about the brain more. Trust me, all that you didn't want to know. Now, of course, Head work um, equals some of the most interesting x-rays. I've seen a lot of different head traumas, guys. I've seen stuff very similar to all three of these. This is from a nail gun, by the way, on the left. This guy was shot up with a nail gun. And if I read the story correctly, all those nails like just missed his brain. They're all like more superficial. Even though it looks like it's going in the brain, it's just kind of grazing the area between the um, scalp and the skull. Now this... Um, yeah, these are also grazing as well. It looks like it's all going into his skull and stomp, but it just missed everything, if I read that story correctly. Up on the top, does anybody know what that is? Shotgun pepper. Buckshot, shotgun pellets, correct. This guy was shot in the face by a shotgun. 
very lucky because I've seen people shot in with a shotgun. It usually is a lot more nasty than that. Usually when I see a shotgun victim that's been shot in the head, the whole face has been disintegrated. Like it just blows up the head. Like, you ever think like a video game when you blow someone's head up with a shotgun? That might be a bad example. It's very similar in real life. Very similar in real life. It just it eradicates the face and the skull. Do you have a question, Johns? Yeah, the last nail on that patient, did that go through the spinal cord? This, it did not. So it, like I said, I read the story correctly. It was all just missed vital the, organs. The major. Oh, it probably went like very went to the side. Yeah, oh. yeah. Of course, this was due to a, this. This actually kind of reminds me of the story Cody was telling me. This guy was stabbed by his wife in the head by, with a butcher knife Ooh. or whatever kind of knife that is. She already looks like she knocked she out his teeth. Brain. She just missed the brain. Yes, that's that's superficial. That's superficial. <laughs> Now I've seen a lot of crazy stuff, um, namely a lot of uh, skull stuff I did was for abuse cases on children, but a lot of car wrecks with really major head trauma, a lot of dog injuries as well. Mm. Um, two in particular that I'll never forget that I did head x-rays on were in the trauma room. A, a, well, one in particular is one I've never been able to get the image out of my head because this kid was tore up. This kid got um, chewed up by a pit bull. Mm. And this two-year-old had his scalp completely peeled mm. off the skull so the pit bull had like literally scalped the child, so there was an exposed skull, and his ear was completely eaten off, and all the tissue right here was ripped away from the face. So this kid was like, yeah, not, they, I mean, plastic survived. surgery, they survived, but even with plastic surgery, there wasn't much to, to fix that, so that kid was really messed up. Do you remember how old this was? It was a two-year-old. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so that was a nasty one, that was a nasty one. But, uh, head trauma can be quite traumatizing if you've never seen it before. And speaking of kids, here's just some example of some child abuse cases. When you talk about child abuse, aside from the ribs, probably the one of the more common areas you see injuries are on the head. Because what abusers will do is often they'll shake the baby really hard. You've heard of shaking baby syndrome. They'll shake the head and the skull flops around like this. A lot of times that will sever the um, cervical spine or fracture the cervical spine and cause separation of the fontanelles and the skull. Fontanelles are the points of growth when we're talking about the sutures forming as an adult. A lot of parents will hit their kids on the head as well or punch them. A lot of that happens and it will cause fractures like you see right there and separation like you see right here. Um, probably the one that I saw the most, which was just always disgusting, is that people will take things and throw them or hit them against walls, especially on the back of the head or they'll slam them down in the crib really hard because they're upset. Like one of the stories that would always get, my, get on my nerves, like it would say a parent got angry at child crying all night and slammed the kid on the crib and fractured the back of the occipital bone. It's crazy to me, but- um, How do you not react to that? Like, oh It's hard not to, trust me. It's really hard not to, but yes. Does that happen? Like, you know when people like throw their babies in the air and they catch them? Does that happen too? If they miss them, yeah. <laughs> or, yeah. No, but, no, but you, know, you, know, you, know, you, know, you catch them, like, doesn't their head... That can be dangerous, yes. It yeah. causes them to almost have, like, whiplash. Like, a yeah. whiplash effect. I don't recommend doing that, by the way. I don't recommend doing that. So, when you say the shaking the baby syndrome, you don't mean, like, like, no, like no, that little... Just, no, I'm talking about yeah. they take their legs, like, they do this. Okay. Yeah, a lot of... Um, a lot of parents, once again, a lot of stories I've given, like they're irritated at the baby. The baby was crying too much, so they take the baby and shake it like this. Like, shut up, stop crying. Um, that's some of the, when I was in the adoption process, that's some of the training I gave us as well, that a lot of the kids that would come into the adoption system were shaking babies, parents doing that. Um, people pick up the babies with the arm, not like here, but with the arm, but then dislocate. It can, yes, I don't recommend and doing I that hate, either. Like, I hate, and I, like, you know, some friends or something, they do, they like do that, and, um, I'm like, don't do that. Don't, don't do be afraid like, to chew out your family members for doing stuff like that, because I sure have. I even told my husband. I've told my family members, I said, don't <laughs> touch my family. I've, to, I've told, I have told cousins, like, uncles, aunts, I say, don't touch my kid anymore. Don't do that. Yeah, I told him. I was like, oh, don't pick him up like that. Like I told him, I, me and my husband did it like initially, but then he didn't do it anymore. Like, like how? How'd you do that? He, well, he, uh, they picked him up like with just holding the arm, and then you know, not like right here, oh, just holding the arm and just going like that, you know, like, yeah. And Children like, are resilient, but they're also fragile at the same time. Well. You gotta be, you gotta be careful. Don't be afraid to speak up on that kind of stuff. I, I sure do. Yeah, I, I tell them, I was like, don't oh. do that. Don't, 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 don't touch my kid again. Stop. Don't get me started. I've already chewed out so many people. 
And they, they give me a little leeway because they know I worked at the Children's Hospital for like 10 something years. So. Well, he's strong. But, well, his brother, yeah, but be careful. Yes. But you'll see a lot of this stuff, guys. Uh, mainly what you see the most of are fractures like, like this right here and these separations of the fontanelles. Because as you know, with children, cartilage, the bones are forming together. Those fontanelles are the division points between the skull, facial bones, cranial bones. And if a baby is injured, <coughs> It will cause those fontanelles to separate further and actually exposes the brain. Exposes the brain and can cause a lot of neurological damage to the child. All right, so let's talk about the main topography of the skull. Now, all of these terms you need to know. You need to know how to identify these. And by the way, when you make your models on Friday, these are some things you probably want to add to your styrofoam head. Now, before I show you a picture, let's see how much you all know, because you must know how to point these out on yourself and your partners, especially for lab, when you're positioning for all these various x-rays that go over. Starting with the very first one, the globella. Where's the globella? Right here. Right here. And y'all, well, some of y'all are correct. Yeah. Wait, I thought it was right here. Globella, there's a little bump right here, right above where your eyebrows come together. This little bump right here. If you move your finger up and down, you can feel the bump. That's the glabella. It's not up here, that's the frontal bone. Oh. Right here. You feel a little bump, a little ridge? Yeah. That's your glabella. What about the inner campus? Let's see if y'all can, I can see one person point correctly. Is anyone else gonna attempt that? Where's the inner campus? Is this copy Shemekha? <laughs> Shemekha is correct, so look at Shemekha if you need a reference. The inner campus is the inner portion of the eyes right John's here. Camera. Where your tear ducts are, by the way. Your tear ducts are located at the inner campus. So, if that's the inner campus, where's the outer campus? So the outer edges, where your eyes come to a point. Some people have sad outer campuses, some people have happy outer campuses, some people have neutral outer campuses. You know what I'm talking about? So I have sad eyes, happy eyes, neutral eyes. Wait, are these palpation points? These are topographic landmarks we use for centering points. Oh, okay. Yes, yes. Don't palpate someone's inner campus. Yeah, campus. I was like... Don't, don't be talking about my gunion. <laughs> We're going to talk about that gunion. What about the nasion? That's an easy one. Where's the... Oh, careful, careful. I'm glad you did that because a lot of people make that mistake. What happened? So she pointed right here for nasion. Nasion is actually where, guys? It's the top of your nasal bone. So be careful. Remember, the glabella is right here, and right below it is the nasion. It's basically where your nasal bone connects to your frontal bone. Nasal bone, nasal bones, plural, there's two of them. Nasal bones connect to the frontal bone. What about the infraorbital margin? And it's in the word, guys. It's in the word, infraorbital margin. The you see orbital, what's that referring to? Eyes. The eyes. So where's the infraorbital margin? You see that line under, where the bags of your eyes will be if you're tired. <laughs> if you have bags under your eyes, that's your infraorbital margin. I often have bags under my eyes. John, you're going to be able to find it then. <laughs> what about the acanthion? That's right under your nose. Yeah, so where that little septum is on your nose, right below it, kind of where you have that little indentation above your lips, that's your acanthion. That's a big one there. We use that one a lot. What about that good old gunion, or as you should say correctly, the gonion? Where's the gonions, plural? Gonions. Little points on the bottom of your mandible, correct? Right here. Gonions. Not the mental point. I'm glad. <laughs> I was like, going to say someone's gonna do that. It's the tip of your chin, not the men, not saying like I'm going mental. It's the mental point up here. <laughs> mental is not referring to mind. Mental actually refers to the mandible. Mandible, so it's the tip of your chin. That's the mental point. <laughs> is anyone going mental yet? I hope not. We're hanging in there. We have but, like two points out of ten. Just one. Just one. The mental point. So like the center of the tip of your chin. Oh, mm -hmm. I have two. You have two? Like two pointy bones. You have two pointy bones? Yeah. Still gonna be in the middle of them. That's like, that that that's like a dead. That's like a dead. I do. Chin. <laughs> booty chin. I haven't heard that one yet. That's a, I've heard of that one. Before. How about E-A-M? That's a very important one. E-A-M. 
careful. I'm seeing all kinds of different pointing pointings here. EAM. What's EAM stand for? External auditory meatus, or a fancy way of saying your ear hole. Oh, oh we'll talk about your ear hole. That's the external auditory meatus, the hole of your ear. Now, what about the auricular point? Oh, I'm gonna go with the You gotta know what the auricle is, first of all, to oh, answer that question. That, is that the, the tip of your ear? Not exactly. I know the auricle I don't know. Think of an, an aura, you know, a shiny aura, kind of like that navicular sign I told you how to do, an aura. Your ears do this little twisty thing, yeah. like this little like right aura shape. If you see where I'm tracing my fingers? I'm not picking ear wax, by the way, don't judge me. <laughs> but this area right here, inside your ear? see that line that curves? Mm -hmm. That line that curves is the auricular point or the auricle of the ear. And then, Okay, if you missed this one, guys, I can't help you. The top of the ear attachment. Oh, T. It's just the top of your ear, guys. <laughs> the top of your ear. The T-E-A. Top of the ear attachment. So that's our major topography of the skull. And there we have it right there. Great picture to make reference. I believe that's in your book. You will see this not only from me, but they use the same image on your registry. Except so they don't have the nice words there. They have just letters. You have to point out what they are. So here we go, guys. Of course, you should know what the MSP is. That has not changed. But there's that glabella, followed by the nasion. We have the inner and outer campus, that infraorbital margin, or the bags of our eyes. And then it's drawn like the bags of our eyes. The acampion, the gonion, the mental points. And there's one that we haven't seen yet, but there's another very important one, the interpupillary line. That is a big one to write down. That is the only way that we can ensure that the head is not turned or tilted on a head x-ray. That is what we use to make sure it's nice and straight and level. So you can think about, oh, you know what a level is when you're doing construction? You also want to imagine you have a level, you're going to use your pencils in lab, and you're holding it up to the pupils of the eye. If you look at someone's pupils, two little black points in the eyes, you drew an imaginary horizontal line through those pupils. That's the interpupillary line. So it even describes itself, interpupillary line. And what did you say it meant again? Hmm? What did you say it meant again? We use it as a, a basically a leveling point of the head to make sure it's straight and not turned when we're doing x-rays. Yes? It depends on the position of the skull. It changes. We're going to get to that. Now there's a couple others guys, that top of the ear attachment, the article of the ear, the EAM, there's the gonion again, there's a side view, the venture point, the cantheon, nasion, glabella. And then we have these lines that we gotta start talking about. Now that's what you see on my little model here, guys. This is what we're gonna make on Friday. Each of those lines represent a different way that we can center and shift the skull or the head to be able to view the anatomy in different ways. Starting with the uppermost one, we have the GML or the glabello meatal line. glabello meatal line. Right underneath that, originating at the pupil, by the way, we have the orbito meatal line. It goes straight to the orbit. It's in the word. By the way, these words describe where they originate. If you haven't noticed, glabella starts at glabella. Orbito starts at the orbit or center of the pupil. Then the infraorbital, where you think that starts? at the eye bags like we talked about, infraorbital line, a campiomeatal line, and then find a mentomeatal line. That's what each of these lines here represents. And depending on how we're doing the x-ray, we will want one of those lines to be perpendicular to our IR. So if my hand's the IR, you'll notice the lines are all kind of angled, correct? Because mm -hmm. if I tilt the skull the right way, these different lines will become horizontal and straight. Now see what I'm talking about? Mm -hmm. So that's how we gotta master those lines because depending on what the position calls for, it might say, I want the AML to be perpendicular to the IR. I have to turn the head correctly. I can't see what I'm doing, but I have to turn the head correctly and make sure that AML is straight, horizontal, and pointed straight at my IR. IOML, that's one we use a lot. I have to tilt the head enough to make sure that line is horizontal and straight. That way I'm positioning the skull correctly. I am projecting the anatomy correctly. One thing you'll also notice, even though they all start at different points, they all end at one singular point, that being the EAM. So when we learn to hold our pencils up, 
we're going to learn to visualize these lines on our faces, our partner's faces, and turn the, or tilt the skull up and down accordingly to make sure that line is horizontal and straight and perpendicular to our IR. Making sense so far? Mm -hmm. Y'all with me? Mm -hmm. So when I say we have to master these lines, you can't do any of the positioning we're talking about in this chapter if you don't master where these lines are. So where do you think you'll make the most mistakes? They use the wrong lines. So it might need IOML, but I use AML instead. That's going to throw the entire position off if I don't use the correct positioning line. So we'll come back to that a lot more when we do actual positioning. But like I said, we're going to make these models on Friday, and this can be a great reference point for you to even practice at home when you're having to master all these numerous skull projections that we're going to be talking about in the positioning chapter. It's going to help you a lot, trust me. How many projections is it? A lot. <laughs> I didn't even bother to count because um, I've actually eliminated a lot of them so the number keeps changing because the curriculum keeps eliminating positions, but even with them eliminating so many, there's still a lot. It's a bunch. All right, so this is just de defining those lines more specifically, guys. Starting with the OML, that is a line from the outer campus to the EAM. So if you see these definitions, a great example, I might say, what is the line that's described as the outer campus to the EAM? We said OML. Know both names, by the way, the full name and the shortened name. Underneath that, we have the infraorbital meal line. That's going to be from the infraorbital margin to the EAM. And what's easy to remember is they all terminate once again at the EAM, these different starting points. And the starting point is in the actual word. It's not as difficult as it looks like. Glabello meal line or the GML is from the labella to EAM. Forward, it's still writing. Yeah. All right, here's the other three right here. We have the IPL, also known as the interpupillary line. I'll go back to the second. IPL or interpupillary line. Don't be deceived on that one. That's going to be the only one that's different from those other lines, and that that's the <coughs> line going to the pupils of the eyes, guys. A perpendicular line between the pupils of the eyes. Followed by the AML, it stands for acanthion to EAL. And then find that mento meal line, the MML, that's the mental point or center of the chin, terminating at that EAL once again. So of the six enlisted, make note, put a star on that. The IPL is the only one that's going to have a different termination point. But it doesn't really have a termination point. It's just the line through the pupils of the eyes. But the other ones all start at a different point and end at the same point. So if there's anything right now that of urgency you want to start memorizing and making sure you master are these lines, because when you do this in lab next week, Mr. Fung and Ms. Bonier are going to be throwing these positioning lines all over the place. And if you don't know what they're talking about, you're going to have no idea how to position these skull and facial bone x-rays. They're all 100% reliant on these different lines and landmarks. By the way, if you want to add it to your notes, it's not on this diagram, but another landmark that we refer to often is the very top of the head. It's called the vertex of the skull. This spot right here is the vertex. 
The very top of your head, top of the skull, the vertex. Like basically right here where those sutures come together the top. I used to have a color coded one, but one of the students last year broke it. Ooh. A really nice color coded skull, and someone dropped it and just. It's called the vertex. It's gone. I was with students breaking my stuff. Your marker. Yeah. You're still here. And that's a good point for our first break, guys. It leaves nine o'clock. Okay, go ahead and take a fifteen minute break, guys. Be back by nine fifteen. And we continue on. Some coffee, wake yourself up. We've got some heavy anatomy coming up. <laughs> no, maybe, maybe, I guess. Yeah. Or just the bottom portion of the cranial area. You have a question? You didn't get a full skull cap. You did not get a full <laughs> These are both cranial areas. So the cranial bones are subdivided what we call the calvaria at the floor. So calvaria would be this literal top portion. The floor, if I was to put my hand right here, is like the bottom portion of the cranium. Oh, so that's so where the floor versus calvaria. Two regions. Would he have hydrocephaly or are you no, sure? That's not hydrocephaly. That's just but like, the eyes. He just withered. <laughs> He's withered. The eyes get bigger as the skin recesses. So if you were like riding away essentially and becoming extraordinarily skinny, your eyes would get bigger. Because the skin pulls away from the eyes. Just like how people think your nails grow whenever you're dying. Not actually, it's not like, or when you're dead, that your nails still grow. It's a myth because actually the skin's just pulling back further, making the nails look longer. I thought hair grew for four days. It does, but it doesn't oh, grow after it's... that. Okay. For the same reason, the skin kind of withers away and pulls inward. Oh, that's what was going to help He's 500 years old. Frodo's yeah. eyes started to pull back too. Like huh? Frodo's eyes started to get bigger towards the end. Because he was closer to the source. Mm. As you get closer to the source, it gets more powerful and more evil. Mm. We're going off on the subject here. So we're going to bring this floor there for you. Okay, so let's look at this diagram and we're going to pick out those eight cranial bones. Starting with the frontal bone. You can't miss it. Where's the frontal bone, guys? That's your forehead, your frontal bone. If you're learning how to headbutt somebody, that's what you want to hit them with, is the frontal bone. <laughs> Otherwise, you're going to have a pretty bad time on the rest of your face. <laughs> the frontal bone, of course, is that prominent frontal anterior area. Under that, we have the parietal bones, by the way. This is one of our pairs that counts in the number eight. We have two parietal bones. That is the sides of your skull up here. Up here. Right under that, where your temple is, are the temporal bones. That's also in pairs. You have a left versus right. Also, fun fact, the thinnest area of your skull. If you want to cave someone's head in with a punch, you hit them in the temple. If you want to make someone pass out, you hit them in the TMJ and punch upward. Or the mental. Yeah. Fun fact there. If you mess up the TMJ, it makes someone pass out. But, um, temporal bones in the temporal area. Now, through the orbits, this is the only one you cannot see externally. We have the sphenoid bone. It's in the central portion of the cranium, through the orbits. 
The sphenoid bone is kind of like the anchor of all the cranial bones. All the other cranial bones articulate with the sphenoid. That's a good factor right now. All other cranial bones articulate with the sphenoid. It's got that anchor holding them all together. There's only one of those. There's only one of those. And then we have under the sphenoid bone the ethnoid bone. If you look up your nose, you can see the ethnoid bone just barely through your nostrils. Ethnoid bone is basically right behind this nasal cartilage in the face. So look in here closely once again. Frontal, parietal, there's the sphenoid. Here's the temporals. The temporals go down quite low as you can see. And then the ethmoid in the center right here. Ethmoid being a portion of that bony nasal septum, which we'll talk about here in a little bit. Question? Um, is that ridge area, the start with the P on the sphenoid? Like it, you see where it's blue inside the eye? Or is it the white part inside like the this? eye? Yeah, like it's part of the sphenoid. But the petrous ridges, where are those at? You cannot see those on this model. So oh, okay. petrous ridges, we're only gonna see those on x-rays, okay. unless we have a temporal bone removed from the skull. So we're going to remove it here in a little bit and talk about it specifically. So it's behind the temporal bone? The petrous ridges, they're essentially like kind of behind these zygomatic arches here. I see. We'll talk more about that in a second. Question? The sphenoid bone, you said it's the center. Basically, I, it's, the book doesn't say this, but I call it the anchor of the cranial bones because all other cranial bones articulate with it at some point. Is it on the occipital bone? Hmm? No, the cranial bones are right above the bone. Well, one's below, and one's the, some are to the side as well, but they all articulate with that sphenoid slice. It's like in the middle, it's holding everything together. Like if you remove that sphenoid bone, everything else would fall apart. That's why I call it the anchor. It's holding everything together. Um, the what? The ethmoid is basically like, if you were to take your nose off, like, like Michael Jackson, remove your nose. <laughs> Um, you can see an ethmoid bone straight through, <laughs> straight through the. <laughs> yeah, I love Michael Jackson. Don't, don't get me wrong. I thought about South Park. Like, look, look at how this nose is clear. It goes straight through the the foramen here, the skull. This um, ethmoid bone is directly behind this. It goes straight through the nose holes, like through your nostrils. Your ethmoid bone. Now, looking at the side view, that lateral view, we can see the same thing, guys. But look at how it kind of changes in shape and appearance. Once again, frontal bone, followed by those two parietal bones. They're superimposed, by the way, because we're looking at this lateral. I'm sorry, I missed one. I didn't talk about the occipital bone. Occipital bone you can't see on the AP. That's why I missed it. But look at the lateral. Parietals, plural. We have that sphenoid in the middle. Temporal on the sides. Mm -hmm. And the very back, the very back of your head, is that occipital bone. Occipital bone. And then you can't see it from the side here, but behind this ridge of the orbit, you have an ethmoid bone. The ethmoid bone's like right in front of the sphenoid to give you kind of some context there. That'd be where that ethmoid bone lies. So, the ethmoid bone is more like It's in your nasal cavity, yes. In fact, it houses your ethmoid sinuses. So when you get a runny nose, those ethmoid sinuses are what's emitting the mucus, so to speak. The Occipital bone is the only one that's not fused to the sphenoid? It is fused to the sphenoid. It's it's it comes up over. under here. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. And we're going to do a cross sectional where we look at it a little closer. I'll show you what I'm talking about. Actually, that picture you have right there, Shemekha, shows what I'm talking about. Mm -hmm. That's where the occipital bone articulates right there. There's a picture in your book that shows a cross sectional through the skull where you can see the floor and you'll see where it articulates. So you have. You have one frontal, two parietal, two temporal, one sphenoid, and one ethmoid, and one occipital. Correct. One sphenoid. One sphenoid. Now, we have a lot more today we're going to talk about. We'll break all this down more specifically as we go through each part. Of course, we got to know all these sutures. We're going to talk about those. We got to know a lot of these landmarks. One big one, by the way, that external occipital protuberance. We're going to talk more about that. Some people have very large protuberances. Some people don't. Like, I have a very big bump on the back of my occipital bone. Like, you can really feel it. Some people do not. But there's a bump back here. If you palpate that, that's the external occipital protuberance or the ineon. Not inion, the ineon. Not to be confused with gonion, which is on the mandible. That's the ineon. 
we'll come back to all that anatomy here in a second. We're still doing more of a overview of everything together. Oh, there it is. I had it in here. There's that cranial floor. Now, this is one of those things where I say, don't freak out. Mr. Donnie, do I gotta know all those words? Yes, you do. Yeah. Every piece of that you need to know. But we're gonna break it down piece by piece after we break down each individual cranial bone. But this shows kind of the point I was talking about. Here's that sphenoid bone. It's like if I cut the top of my head off and I look down into it. Mm -hmm. Like if I slice this head like this and I look down into it, that's what we're looking at. The cranial floor, by the way. After scooping out the brain. After scooping out the brain. So, of course, there's your frontal bone at the very front. That's the anterior portion. There's that ethmoid right in front of the sphenoid. And y'all see why I said the sphenoid's like the anchor holding everything in the middle? Everything articulates with that sphenoid bone. We have those temporals on each side. We have the occipital back here. And you can barely see it, but there's that parietal right here, guys. Parietal. But we'll come back to that once again. We're still on a general overview of all these individual. We'll learn how to label all this as we move forward. By the way, there's that petrous portion we've been talking about. On top of that temporal bone. Yes. The parietal is on the sides. Probably the one that's the most difficult out of all the cranial bones, the one we'll spend the most time on, is that sphenoid bone. Sphenoid has the most anatomy of all the other cranial bones, and facial bones for that matter. It's a very important one that we have to review. From this view, I feel like the sphenoid bone looks like a stingray. Because the APG is a bird like that. I always thought it kind of was like a bat. Yeah. Um, yeah. Why say stingrays? Because you know how they have those like. Bats. In fact, I have one right here. I have all these individuals. Here's the sphenoid ball. So it kind of looks like a bat with yeah. ears. Yeah. It looks like these horse like the one you killed? Or an eagle. It looks like some kind of animal. Yes. Like that bat that you killed? <laughs> it was about that size. <laughs> it's the moth that Gandalf killed. <laughs> he said it was either that or me. <laughs> Here's another picture. I, I, so this is from another book. I put this in here for y'all if y'all want to take a picture. I like this picture because it's a lot, mm -hmm. I guess it's a little more simple looking with the colors. It looks like a clown. It looks like a clown. But that's just for you guys if you want to take a picture of that. It's another little model you can use to start memorizing the placement of those cranial bones. Color coding, guys. Color coding is going to be your best friend right now. Color code those bones. Take a picture, we good? So when it says left greater uh, left greater wing, that's just the branches that go out to the left or right. The wings are referring to the sphenoid bone. You have greater and lesser wings. We'll, we'll get to that. So cranial bones, when we talk about that calvaria versus floor, we have different cranial bones that fall into those categories. When we say calvaria or the top portion, that's gonna be specific to the frontal, occipital right parietal and left parietal. And be careful because a lot of people tend to assume occipital goes on the floor, but it's actually part of the overall calvaria because of the way the skull curves. Now when we talk about the floor portion, that's gonna be containing the ethmoid, the sphenoid, and that right left temporal cranial bone. Please know how those are classified. Calvaria versus floor. That's a great multi-answer, multiple choice question there. And it's occipital, not occipital, as I've heard some people say. It's actually temporal, not temporal. Yeah. It's not phenoid, it's sphenoid. Or not sphenoid, I first one say sphenoid too. Now, I do have a nice mnemonic for you guys coming up. Y'all don't have to use my mnemonic. I thought this one was kind of cute and fits the theming, but feel free to come up with your own mnemonic if you don't like what I have mm -hmm. here on the next slide. I think it's the next slide. Is it Lord of the Rings related? It is. I think it's it's got to go with the theming. And there we go, yes. So Frodo eats two of Sam's potatoes. There you go, frontal bone, ethmoid, two for two temporal, of occipital, sam sphenoid, and potatoes, plural, for two parietal. So kind of
labels those double ones for you as well. Did y'all watch that scene in y'all's movie? Yeah. Marathon? Yeah. 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 So mnemonics are going to be your best friend as well, guys. You can use mine or come up with your own. But what I would do before I take any test from here on out, because we're always going to be having head work from now on, even on our review course, write out that mnemonic for your cranial and facial bones so you can have that as a reference point. Because I'm telling you, at least for the past two years, seniors have forgotten these so quickly. These have not stuck. So get yourself a mnemonic that works and write that out on your scratch sheet for each test. They will ask you these on the registry as a multi-answer question. Please select all that are considered cranial bones. Please select all that are considered facial bones. How many cranial do you have? How many facial do you have? How many total skull bones do you have? A lot of questions right there on a matter of seconds. They're getting nervous, but I would say the majority are right on track. And I'm, I'm, the majority. Correct. Both temporals. Should you say right and left? All right. So let's talk about our sutures. Now, what are sutures? Well, as a child, we of course have fontanelles, and when those bones fuse together at those growth plates, as we learned about, they form what we call sutures. Now, sutures do fall under the category of a joint. In fact, they are fibrous joints. Fibrous joints. Do fibrous joints move around? No. Mm -hmm. They do not. Why would we not want those to move around? Well, if your skull is moving around, uh, you might want to get that checked out. Do you want leaking brain juice? Yeah, you don't want those sutures moving around. So they're going to be the fibrous joints actually connecting the bone of the skull. We have four. By the way, there actually are more than these sutures you see here, but these are the four major ones that we need to know for radiography. That's the coronal suture, the sagittal, the squamosal, and the lambdoidal. Now coronal is going to be what's between the frontal and parietal bones. If I turn the skull like this, here is the coronal suture. I'm tracing my hand right here. It's the coronal suture. Uh, it lines up with the MCP, by the way, mid-coronal plane. That's the way you can remember that. Now, like the sagittal plane, mid-sagittal plane, that's this line right here. Lines up with the MSP. So the, the sagittal, that's going to be what actually separates the two parietal bones. Only the two parietal bones, by the way. Squamosal, that's a fun word, squamosal. That's going to be near the temple, right? Should I point in the right spot here? Yeah, right here. That's going to be what separates the temporal and parietal bones. You see right here where I'm running my finger on my face. Squamosal, where that weak point of your temporal bone is, by the way, that thin little area. And then lambdoidal, it's all the way in the back. I'm going to turn the skull like this. That's the articulation between the occipital and both parietal bones, where I'm running my finger right here. So all four of those, you need to know where they're located. Go to label them on a diagram, which I'll show you in a second. And make sure you know what's articulated between those sutures. So grazing over questions, select all cranial bones that form the sagittal suture. We you just choose the left and right parietal bone, that's the only two. See how that can be kind of tricky? Can you uh, repeat what uh, the sagittal separates? The sagittal separates the left and right parietal bones. Well, like I said, at least for those first two, one way you can remember that is they're comparable to the MCP and MSP lines okay. and where they're located. Make sure you all, know that all four of those are fibrous joints. They're immovable. If it was me, that'd be something I would add to my model on Friday, those sutures, at least on one side. Those sutures tend to trip people up quite a bit. 
especially on when we're talking about like what do they articulate with. Does squam squamosal. What do they separate? Squamosal is going to be separating the. Um, where my thing go? Temporal and parietal. Oh, okay, okay. That's one. So I always say it helps to see. It's this line going right here. See it? Oh, Temporal okay. bone and parietal. And land oil in the very back. Okay. For occipital and parietal. So whatever is between, that's what it separates. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, horizontal line in the back. Okay. I got a diagram to show y'all that you can take a picture with as well. I like the diagram I have here better than the one in the book. I think it's not this is lot, next slide, but the next one. So you now, said that we have That separates the parietals and the occipital, mm -hmm. or articulates them. Okay. Now, these are what we call junction points. As the sutures come together, they form a junction. So we have the bregma. That's going to be the junction of the coronal and sagittal. By the way, that's right here. Helps to see it. See how these sutures come together and meet at one point? Mm -hmm. That's a junction point. So there's your bregma. I'm going to point my finger. Mm -hmm. Now, which I have my color model. It's so much better than this one. It was one of our seniors. It was a combination of Anthony and Nick. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Of course. <laughs> Were you mad? I was mad, but I was disappointed. Disappointed. You know, I really, I really oh, liked that, God. I really liked that model. Don't you hate when your parents say you're disappointed in you? <laughs> That's worse than me mad at you. I'm so disappointed in you, son. <laughs> the lambda is, of course, going to line up with that lambdoidal suture. That's the junction of the sagittal and lambdoidal suture. On the back here, the lambda. I need to say that third one. Terion. It's Terion. Not Paterion. It's just Terion. That's going to be a three-way junction. That's between the parietal, squamosal, and greater range of the sphenoid. That's right here, guys. Basically, I'm trying to fill in my face. It's over here. Like, right here where I'm pointing on my head. Right here, guys. Junction of the parietal, squamosal, and greater range. This one's a lot heavier than I remember it being. So you're telling me you just walk guys away. That's it. I bet you they haven't you even known. Come on, you might know. not know. You might miss. And then the asterion, <laughs> asterion, that's the judge of the occipital, parietal, and mastoid. It's way down here, guys. Way down here. That's the asterion. I do have a good diagram coming up for y'all to take a picture of that shows it a little better. You want to hear how cool it is? I'm not lying. I think it's supposed to weigh like an actual, like a human, like if you were to hold a human head, that's what it would weigh like. About that weight, if I'm not mistaken. Sorry, for the deal. So this is also a three way junction? Yes. So that's one. Yes. And what's conjunctions are the sutures coming together at a single point. Kind of like a railroad junction. When the railroads come together, they form a junction. Like the railroads found on your head. Railroad system. Hand hurts. Yeah. <laughs> That's not a good sign. We got 300 more slides to go. <laughs> <laughs> Feels like I'm learning a whole different language. It really is. So, Mr. Stone, what are these These are junctions. As the sutures meet, they form a junction. That's the sutures. As the sutures come together, they form a junction. I got a picture. It's going to map it out for you. It's a lot easier to see on this picture. The symbol for lambda is like the squiggly. Yes. Okay. The half life symbol. The half life symbol, yeah. That's perfect. It's a lambda. And there you go, guys. This is not your book, but I recommend you take a picture of this. This basically maps out everything we just talked about. Each suture, each junction, and various views for you. It's a great little reference point for you. Um, so one thing to make note of is that you have one bregma 
one, te I'm sorry, not one Terion, you have one Bregma, one Lambda, two Terions, two Asterions. You have one Coronal Suture, one Sagittal Suture, but you have two Squamosal and two Lambdoidal Sutures. It's a good thing to write down as well. Can you repeat the Bregma Lambda? Sure, for the junctions, you have one Bregma, one Lambda. You have, I'll say it like this, you have a right and left Terion, and a right and left asterion. Now for the sutures, you have one coronal suture, one sagittal suture, you have a right and left squamosal suture, and one lambdoidal suture. I think I said that one was two, that's actually one. I apologize. Which one? One lambdoidal one? suture. Just one? Yeah, because it connects as one suture. So for the sutures, the only one that's left and right is the squamosal. Wait, so the asterion is just by the EAM and the occipital, right? It's actually behind it. It's back here. Kind of where those mastoid tips are. Mm -hmm. It's back here. Right. So yeah, how, did, how is it written in that last slide? That's the asterion right there. Okay. Yeah, you don't see it. No, so I said, uh, oh. <laughs> Is there three sutures right there? Yeah, because remember there's like a triple. Well, no, there's no suture down here. It's just, that's just correct. <laughs> so it's it's just kind of of yeah, them. they come together right here. <laughs> Can you go back uh, one slide? I want to see how it's worded. On sure. The Everyone got it. Oh, oh, oh. oh. You know what? Oh. We're going to blame that one on JP and Anthony, too. Make sure you all the way. I thought you put it down. You put it on, like, on in. Mr. John, he was losing his head, isn't he? Hey. <laughs> she got a spirit was like, but sir. Mr. John, you need a walk. You need a walk. It's just time to go. It's eight class now. You can let us both be in the gym during lunch. We I'm quite clumsy all the time, so. It's just very easy. It's just a lack of talk. Because he's filled it. You're so clumsy. What? Oh, don't know how I was. Yeah, it's, it's easy. He said, I was in flight or flight or flight. I was, I was in the zone. I was in, you no, know, I was in protect my kids mode. I was in the zone. All right, let's now go to the fontanelles. Now, make note, fontanelles are for pediatrics only. I mostly our babies, our infants. Fontanelle is defined as the area of incomplete ossification <laughs> in infant skulls, or as we say in layman terms, the soft spots. Now, I don't recommend you do this, but you may have accidentally done it. If you ever palpate a baby's head, you can feel the soft spots. Mm -hmm. By the way, don't do that. You're actually moving their brain around when you do that. You realize that? You actually give them brain damage doing that. Yeah, I never don't push the soft spots. A little tail. <laughs> but the adult cranial size, the full size, is typically achieved, or, well, not full size, but we consider adult size is achieved by age 12. And that's when those font nails completely ossify, age 12. And we have them, yes? Talking about uh, font nails, I don't know if it's true or not, but um, back in the old days, they used to say if when the baby is uh, like drinking milk or anything like that, and the milk is falling out, Oh, really? So they flip them upside down and then they hit their, their, their feet. That way the, nice. something pops out. Yeah, <laughs> something pops out. I would not recommend doing that. You can see like, no. like a pulse too. Yeah. Right? You can sometimes, yeah. Right. So depending on the child, you can sometimes see the font nail pulsing on top of their head. Mm -hmm. Good little soft okay. spot. That's the brain. Yeah. That's the brain. Sometimes when I'm getting like. Andrew, I can see it. Cool, thank you. It's, <laughs> it's normal, by the way. It's not abnormal. Oh, now we do have several, we have the label guys, please make note, we have the anterior, anterior font nail, we have the sphenoidal font nail on the side, the mastoid font nail, which is about right underneath your ear, back here, and then you have the posterior or the lambdoidal font nail, posterior or lambdoidal font nail. So you're back, like five in total? There's four. Four? Well, I guess technically, because you have a left and right, left and right, you have two, four, six. So six? Yeah. So anterior fontanelle, posterior or lambdoidal fontanelle, 
two sphenoidals, and two mastoid mottonels. Uh, baby skulls are so interesting. Um, where I went to school in Lake Charles at the university when I was doing A&P, uh, they had real bones for us to play. They had actual real baby skulls <laughs> that were donated that you could um, handle and study. And they, it's like, it's so creepy, not only because it's like a real skull, but how paper thin baby skulls are. It almost feels like you just crumple it up like paper. Whereas a you know, adult skull, it's really hard, like really, really hard. The baby skull, it's like literally just like, it's like it's made of paper. That's what it feels like. So you imagine how easily they can be injured when we're talking about child abuse, when people hurt children, their bones are just so fragile. Can you say the number again? Yeah, you have one anterior, one posterior, two sphenoidal, two mastoid. It's for your front nails. The posterior was also known as lamb, lamb uh, so Posterior can also be called lamb, lamb doyle or lamb duh. Lamb. <laughs> uh, you, have, you, have one, you have one anterior, one anterior, one posterior, also called lambda or lambdoidal. You have two mastoid and two sphenoidal fontanelles. When I say two, it's a left and a right. And what was the last one? Sphenoidal. Don't mix those up with your junctions and your sutures because the names are quite different. And so about fontanelle versus suture and junction. Keep that in mind. And these are only on the infants? They're only on the infants. Mastoidal? Technically these exist until the age 12 in some form because the bones are ossifying and fusing. Mastoid or mastoidal? Mastoidal. Well, I'm sorry, mastoid. mastoid. I'm thinking of sphenoidal. Mastoid. Okay. What about this one? Like, um, I guess... Well, is, cleft palate. Yeah, like cleft palate. That's like, a deformity of the um, of the jaw, the upper jaw. Okay, so it's not like from. Uh, yeah, we have to do a front nails, no. Okay. I saw a lot of those. You see a lot of those cleft palates. And actually, they can, with the advancement with like plastic surgery, like they can make it look almost flawless now when they repair that. I had a friend who had it in elementary school, and then by the time we got to middle school. Um, they've gotten it fixed, but uh, they moved away because people were harassing them about it. That's mm. messed up. Bullying so oh, messed baby. up. I got bullied in school too. It's it's messed up. It's cool. It's even worse now with all the social media stuff and texting. I thought it was bad when I was a kid. You know, we didn't have the cell phones yet. It was just <laughs> traditional bullying, and that still sucked. But mm -hmm. uh, yeah. should have been my friend. I didn't have. But you know, I look at those bullies now. I'm like, yeah, look where you're at. Look where I'm at. Uh, mm -hmm. Took me in high school. <laughs> <laughs> Most of them are like bums doing nothing with their life. So. In fact, all of them are bums doing nothing with their life. <laughs> all right. So last um, section we're going to talk about here before we start diving into the individual. Um, cranial bones, which will probably do that on Monday because I'm almost out of time. What about Friday? We're doing our project on Friday. The whole, whole time? Probably. <laughs> I'll see. I'll see. We might just, we'll see how long it takes y'all. So we have Friday off. <laughs> so we have Friday off. <laughs> okay, so internally, the cranial floor is divided into three regions. We have the anterior cranial fossa, middle cranial fossa, and posterior cranial fossa. What's the purpose of these? These actually help protect different areas of our brain. This is the only parts of the brain you need to make sure you know. And we're referring to how the cranial floor houses and protects these portions of the brain. Anterior is going to house the frontal lobes of the cerebrum. Cerebrum is the big, largest part of the brain, by the way, where all the little wrinkles are. And it's going to extend from the anterior frontal bone to the lesser wings of the sphenoid. The middle is going to house the temporal lobes of the brain, located in the temporal section of the skull. It extends from the lesser wings of the sphenoid to the apices of the petrous ridges. And then finally, that posterior cranial fossa, the deep depression right behind or posterior those petrous ridges that protects the cerebrum. The, 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 the. What was that? That was a big tongue tie there. That protects the cerebellum, the pons, and the medulla oblongata. 
Have you ever seen The Water Boy? You know what that reference is. <laughs> no, one's seen, no one's seen that movie? The Water Boy? Adam Sandler. Adam Sandler? I just remember Where he gets mad at the professor the, and tackles him. So there's a scene in that movie where they're talking about the brain and the different emotions it causes. And if you don't know the movie, um, Adam Sandler's playing this redneck from Hick from Louisiana. Somewhere in Louisiana. Yeah. And he was raised by his mama, but he gets to go he gets to go to college and he's sitting in class and the professor's talking about the brain and emotions and his mom told him that like emotions come from like rays of sunshine and all this kind of stuff. So the professor's like, Where does happiness come from? Or no no, he says, Where does aggression come from? And um Wait, 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 I'm sorry, I've said that wrong. Oh. So he says, Where's happiness come from? And Adam Sandler goes, oh, from Rays of Sunshine. And no, he's like, no, you're incorrect, sir. It comes from the ponds of the brain. Da, da, da. So he says, what do you guys think it is that makes alligators naturally ornery? He uses the word ornery. What makes alligators ornery? Um, so Adam Sandler raises his hand. He's like, well, my mama says, my mama says that alligators are ornery because they got all those teeth and no toothbrush. <laughs> and... Uh, the professor goes, no, mama's wrong again. It comes from an enlarged medulla oblongata. And then um, Adam Sandler's like, but my mama says, he's like, it's the medulla oblongata. <laughs> and he gets mad, and so there's something wrong with his medulla oblongata. And <laughs> Adam Sandler ends up like tackling the professor, and it's, it's really Why funny. I don't know if I did that scene justice, but I was trying to remember it off the top of my head. But. You should look it up. Definitely. I'm sure it's on YouTube, but yeah, study hall. Every time I see a doula Abangada, I think of that scene. sunshine that come down when you're feeling blue. <laughs> well, folks, mama's wrong again. 